Angel, thank you for that song. And uh, that probably should have been our theme song for this series, right? I'm fine. No, we're not fine. It's not being honest with where we're actually at. Maybe there are large aspects of our lives that are totally fine. And that is an absolutely true statement. But there are probably areas of our lives that are not fine. But we are convinced or trying to convince ourselves and others that they are fine. So thank you for those uh, incredible words in that song. Uh, Tip of the iceberg. We conclude this morning our series, Tip of the Iceberg. And so just by way of review, what we often say... Uh, or how we live our lives is that an iceberg is 10% above the water and 90% below the water. And what we often do is reveal that 10%. It's like, this is who I am. This is me, this 10%. But then there's the 90% that's underneath and the 10% is saying, yeah, we're fine. I'm fine. This is my life. This is who I am. But under the surface, there's all this stuff going on. And some stuff we realize it's there and we just want it under there. And some stuff we don't even know fully what is going on and what the implications of it are or how it even got there. And so we've just continued to scratch the surface of this and try to figure out how we bring more of who God made us to be above the surface, who we become more authentic with who God put us on this earth to be. And so a couple of weeks ago, we posed the question when someone asks, how are you? Often the response is good and then a deflection. I'm good. How are you? In order to not fully answer the question or not to be fully honest with how we are. And another answer That we often do, that is like top three on my list, and I'm sure it's on your list as well. Jeremy, how are you doing? Good, but busy. Good, I'm busy. And then if somebody dares to probe, because if we're being honest, if we're the ones asking the question, sometimes we don't even care that much. (laughs) Like, let's just be honest about that. Sometimes we don't care to get deeper when we're asking how someone's going. And that's something we need to realize in ourselves too. Just that authenticity of wondering how people are going. But if someone then digs a little bit further, oh, well, what's more busy? Is there something especially busy going on in your life? Something new, something different? And then we often answer, no, just normal, busy, just the usual busy. Busyness for us, maybe in our culture, certainly not just unique to us here in America, here in Eastport, here in New York, but it's become like this badge of honor to be busy. It's become this point of pride to be busy. It's like, I'm Jeremy. I'm busy. (laughs) And we wear this. It's like, hey, did you see lately? I've been pretty busy. You should be pretty proud of me because life, it's busy. So, you know, like I'm pretty important. I've got a lot of things. You're like, I'm doing all this stuff and I've got a lot of things and I'm, I'm busy. So like, hey, like just in case you're wondering, busy here. And in some ways... It kind of shows or tries to reveal our value, but in other ways, it kind of protects us from being fully vulnerable. Because if we get into a situation where, like, we've got to put ourselves out or we've got to take the time to do this, we can just use this guise of, no, I'm busy. I I got a lot of things to do, a lot of people to see, work to do, family stuff. I'm just, I'm Jeremy and I'm busy. And then once you say that, be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. I get it. I'm busy too. Yeah, yeah. Let's just, let's just leave here right now. We can go on with our busyness because we're both really important. We've got a lot of things going on. And of course, this is exaggerated, but I think many of us are probably sitting there going, yeah, 
Yeah, it would kill me to say, I'm Jeremy. Yeah, I've got nothing going on. Do you want to hang out? <laughs> I, got, I, I have literally all the time in the world. Do you want to use some of it? I want to be fully present with you right now. Let's hang out. That person would probably be creeped out. Because that person's walking around going, no, nah, I'm just asking how you're doing, but I'm busy. I don't want to be too invested here. I just need to keep moving because I'm busy. Like We do this. And so how is it then as Christians that we be who God wants us to be while also being so busy? I read this week that the average person The average iPhone user touches his or her iPhone 2,617 times. You're hoping I say a year. You're hoping I say a month. You're hoping I say a week. A day. So then we have this thing. It's like, oh, I'm so busy. I've got all these things. And if I'm not in the midst of the busyness, then we just go, I got to see... Who else is busy? I got to see what else is going on. I got to check in and make sure I'm still busy. Even though I've got like 10 minutes of free time, I'm still got to be busy. And so these things are obvious. And the point of this isn't to just like crush us all. It's not the point at all. The point is to be honest with our busyness or this kind of facade of busyness that we often put out and realize that There's some stuff being shoved under the surface that we've just shoved because of our busyness or because of the portrayal that we want to have of being so busy and so involved with things. And so we started this series talking about how Jesus wants all of us. And he gives people two greatest commands. Uh, Some people came to him and said, Jesus, what's the most important thing? What is the greatest thing that you could impart to us? And Jesus says two things. First, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then he says to love others as you love yourself. Two things. Love God with everything. And then to love others. Love God and love others. The two greatest things that as followers of Jesus that we can do, if we want to be disciples of Jesus, those two things ought to be the most important things. As we are discipling others, as we are being discipled ourselves, as we are trying to follow the model of Jesus, two things. Love God, love others. But how do we love well if we are in a big hurry all the time? How do we love well when we are so busy all the time? An example, a couple examples. You're in a hurry. You got to get to your thing. You got an appointment in 15 minutes. The drive is 19 minutes. You've all played that game. You put it in Google Maps and you just hope that the ETA drops below the time you need to get there. And so you're just like, like flooring it to stoplights. It's like, oh, I've got to stop. I've got to stop. Stop. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. That person went yellow. That's a, that's a half second. Okay, here we go. And then you get up there and someone like unnecessarily takes the right turn in front of you and then slows way down. You want to go seven over the speed limit because you've got to get there and they're going two under. How loving are you in that moment? I'm not. In fact, it's probably one of the worst versions of me in that moment. When I'm in a hurry, when I'm busy, love is not high on my list of priorities. It's not high on my list of what comes out of me in those moments. I'm like, come on, just get out of the, take that turn, take that turn. Like, No, we just got to get there. And this person doesn't understand that we're busy. 
We're important. We're in a hurry. We got to keep going. Love isn't high on the priority list. Some of you have family. Some of you have kids. Some of you have spouses. How is it that morning when you have to be somewhere, even maybe church on a Sunday morning, and things are frantic and clothes are flying and should I wear this? Go brush your teeth. Get, get we got to go. We got five minutes. Now go. How loving are we in those moments? Right? So there's like some, it's like an antonym, love and busy, love and hurry. But yet Jesus says the most important things, these two things, love God with everything you've got and love others just as you love yourself, just as you would want to be loved. But yet when we're so busy and when we're in a rush and when we're in a hurry all the time, it's really hard to do that well. It's not the most loving side of us that comes out. Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 He describes love. It's the famous love chapter. This was super convicting for me this week. Do you know the first word that Paul uses to describe love? Love is patient. Oh, Oh, you mean that in order to fully love, I need to like... Slow down? You mean in order to fully love, I need to be patient with my family? You mean in order to fully love God, I need to stop with this insane pace? And I need to stop putting on this badge like, oh, I'm just busy. I got this, got this and this and this and this. Like God wants all of me. And I'm just going from thing to thing to thing to thing. Trying to, God, keep up. Let's go. We got these stuff, things to do. But Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Love in its essence, the first thing. There's many things that are true about love. But the first thing, patience. Patience. I've said before, I'll say it again. Patience is not a strong suit of mine. And I think it's all wrapped up into this. That I'm busy and I'm in a hurry and I'm then impatient. And then that affects how I love. That affects how I love others well. And in fact, what I've seen in myself, and I'm guessing you've seen it in yourself too, is that when I am impatient, when I am hurry, and when I'm busy, the people that I love uh, the least capably are the people that I should be loving the most. The people that I'm most impatient with, the people that I'm most hurried with, the people that I'm most frustrated by in those moments are the people that I should be loving the best and loving the most fully, namely my family, right? And so we do this. We in such a big hurry. But the reality is, is that in order to follow Jesus, In order to kind of process and work through these things properly, we need to reset our order of things. We need to reset our flow of life. You know, like really simple. This is really simple. It's really easy. What we need to do is just change everything. Because I don't think it's working. I don't think it's working very well. I look at my own life. It's like I'm just going and going and going and going and going. And I think I'm missing so much. And I'm just cramming more and more under the surface in the name of busyness, in the name of hurriedness. But I'm missing maybe some of the most important things that God would have for me. Uh, There's this famous scene in the scriptures. If you want to turn there, Luke chapter 10. Such a great example of this. That Jesus enters um, this house to eat a meal with these friends of his. And there are these two ladies, Mary and Martha, who live in this house, these sisters, and they are preparing for Jesus a meal. 
They are housing, or they are taking care of him. They are bringing him in, and they are providing a meal for him. And here is how this story goes in verse 38 to start. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. So imagine this scene. This is my retelling, my visualization of how I see this scene going. Because I've lived this scene many times. I assume you have lived this scene many times. You are doing something. uh, uh, Martha is doing something that she knows is so important. She, we don't know definitively her view of Jesus at this moment. But presumably, she thinks Jesus is the savior of the world. She thinks at minimum, Jesus is this rabbi of all rabbis that is coming to her house. This is a massive undertaking. This is the queen of England coming to eat at your house. Imagine how excitable and nervous And busy, you would be making sure everything is perfect. And so Martha is frantic, getting the best dishes, making sure they are spotless, making sure the silverware, if they had silverware, making sure everything was perfect. The cups were perfectly clean. The wine was the best wine. The food was the best food. Everything was in order and good. And and you can hear her. You can just imagine her clanking around the kitchen, getting everything ready and in order. And then you cut to a shot of her sister, Mary. Mary is in the other room. Mary is just sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening, talking, interacting, hearing stories, telling stories, taking it all in. Martha, here's the scene. Siblings, you know this all too well. Your parents say to do something together. One of the kids One of the siblings is not doing what you together are supposed to do. Martha is in there. You can just imagine her just stewing more and more, like clanking louder and louder, trying to get Mary's attention. You can just imagine her at the doorway, making sure Jesus' back is to her. Like, you can just imagine this scene. Like cheese puffs throwing at Mary. Mary's like, what did that come from? Martha's like, get in here. A just extraordinary scene where she just, and, and so probably Martha's like, should I just go in there? Should I whisper to Mary? Should I just be like, Mary, we got work to do. Just get in here and help me so that we can properly Make sure Jesus is welcomed well. And finally, she decides, you know what? I'm going to surpass Mary. I'm not even going to say anything to her. Jesus will know. Jesus will set this right. Jesus will know the important and the important things that are to be happening right now. And she says to Jesus, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me exclamation mark jesus tell her to help jesus this is this is unjust this isn't right she isn't carrying her weight she isn't doing the stuff she isn't doing the work that she needs to be doing jesus tell her to get in here right now but jesus answers this maybe probably ought to be one of the most convicting answers for us 
in our lives. Because if Mary and Martha lived a fast-paced life, imagine the difference between their life, their lives, and our life today. Imagine how much busier, how much faster, how much more is going on. This answer, I think we should still be listening to and still hearing. Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. I bet Martha heard those words. If I'm Martha, I would hear those words and say, but Jesus, you don't understand. There's so much to do. In order to properly show you how much we love you, we've got 18 things to do in order to do that. And Jesus is saying, Martha, in order to show me how much you love me, do what Mary is doing. Slow down. Enjoy me. Listen to me. Follow me. Stop going from thing to thing to thing to thing, thinking that it's some badge of honor, thinking that you're doing what is so right and so important. What Mary is doing is right. Mary is enjoying me. Mary is listening. Mary is following. Mary is being a part of what is happening in this world through me. Mary is taking this all in. And sometimes I wonder if that's just a perfect picture of how we live our lives. It's like we want to do the right thing in our heart of hearts. We want to do what is right by Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we have this list of things And the lists of things that we are doing are actually some of them really good things and important things and ways in which we follow Jesus. But we add this list of Christian things to do along with our list of all of the other things we have to do. And we just pile it into this same commotion of busyness and we just keep going and going and going and going. And we're just Mary in the other room, clanking things around. Busy, I'm busy. I got all this. Jesus, ah, check me out. Look how involved I am and busy I am and how many of these good things that I'm doing. And I wonder if Jesus is trying with this loudspeaker, Jeremy, stop, stop. What Mary is doing is better. Just slow down. Enjoy me, listen to me, follow me. Stop trying to take me along with your busyness. Be a part of what I want for you in your life. And what we often, how we often fall in this is the busyness makes us weary. The busyness makes us tired. The busyness makes us feel like we have nothing left to give. The busyness kind of gets us to this point where we say things. We say the strangest things. Like, we say things like, ah, I wish there were two of me. (laughs) Or I wish there were five more hours in a day. Wish there was 10 more hours in a day. Then I'd be able to get everything done. No, then we just add more things. We wouldn't ever really be present like God wants us to be present. And so I'm guessing, much like myself, like there's some weariness. There's some burdens that come with your life and in your life and that you are experiencing right now. And I think the most, one of the most amazing uh, things that Jesus said were in these words, Matthew eleven twenty eight. And 
put these in light of all that we experience in the midst of our busyness, in the midst of us going from thing to thing to thing to thing, getting to the point where we don't feel like we have anything left to give, getting to the point where we're just constantly checking boxes and going from this to that to the other thing, constantly putting on that badge of busyness as though it's a badge of honor and if we're being fully transparent with ourselves, that it isn't so much a badge of honor, it's this 100,000 pound weight on our shoulders. And we're just carrying it around, thinking that we're doing something so great, but we know that it just gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And the more burdened we become, the less we have to give of ourselves to those who really fully matter. But Jesus, knowing this, knowing this about humanity, knowing this certainly about people in his day and people in every day, he says this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For years, I always fumbled with this yoke thing. I didn't understand it. And then in, in college, or maybe even a little bit before that, someone put it in perspective, like, no, yoke is like, it was like a Jewish term. And it was like uh, how much the law, like rabbis would have a yoke, and it was how much law and how much burden they would put on it. And then like, They would say, oh, yeah, like a yoke is the thing that puts two oxen together. And the yoke is what they attach the cart or the load behind them to. And so Jesus is saying, my yoke is light. My burden is easy. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. Right? He's saying, I'm not just going to stack all these things. The, the rabbis of the day, the Pharisees of the day were just like, hey, you can follow me, but you got to do this, 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 and that's just one day. The next day, this, 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 and people were trying to follow these things, and they're just walking around with heavier and heavier and heavier things. And much like we do to this day, and it's not always in the name of religion, we do it in the name of busyness. We do it in the name of American life. This, 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 this. And you might walk around just with this yoke that's so heavy and so tedious and so cumbersome. But Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Dallas Willard, theologian, he wrote many books. He says this. In this truth lies the secret of the easy yoke. The secret involves living as Jesus lived in the entirety of his life, adopting his overall lifestyle. Our mistake is to think that following Jesus consists in loving our enemies, going the second mile, turning the other cheek, suffering patiently, and hopefully while living the rest of our lives, just as everyone else around us does. It's a strategy bound to fail. And so what we often do is we say, yeah, yeah, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be a part of that. I'm guessing you are here today because you want to follow Jesus. You want to be a part of that. But what we often do is we take the yoke of Jesus that is easy. The burden is light, but yet, we just take that along with all of our pile of 748 other things that we have going on in our lives. And we just bring it along with us. And what Dallas Willard is saying is that plan is bound to fail. It doesn't work. When we just take our life full of burdens and busyness and all these schedules and everything, and then we just sprinkle in a little Jesus here and there when it works out well for us, it's bound to fail. But I would say that we have, an, we have a huge challenge, but possibility to reset. To say, you know what? 
first and foremost, loving the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, it's making Jesus and following Jesus the preeminent thing in my life. That is going to be the main thing. And that is going to be the foundation for everything else that gets stacked in my life. What I am not saying, what I am not saying is, hey, everyone, just stop your lives. Don't do anything from now on. That's not real. That's not practical. That's not it at all. It's, hey, what's at the foundation? Is busyness for the sake of busyness affecting everything? And Jesus is just sprinkled in here and there. Or is Jesus and following Jesus the preeminent thing? Is it him that you are living and trying to love with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? All of a sudden, I think our balance gets put back right. All of a sudden, we realize that, you know what? The yoke that is so heavy for me right now, it's getting a little lighter. Because the way of Jesus is light. It's easier. It's better. It's more fulfilling. It's more purposeful. Come to me, all you who are wearied and burdened. And so for us, if you are here this morning and you feel like you've got a 100,000 pound weight on your shoulder, maybe it's time to reset. Maybe it's time to say, you know what? I've been laying my life at the feet of what everyone else is doing or what everyone else says I should do. And it's time to lay my life at the feet of Jesus. It's time to reset this thing and say, you know what? My true self isn't coming out because I'm just so busy and I'm so wrapped up and my busyness is causing weariness and burdens and all these things. But I need to reset and say, you know what? First and foremost, the main thing with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, I want to live the way of Jesus. I want to follow my Savior, Jesus, because his yoke is easy and his burden is light.